Good afternoon and welcome to the Tiny Build Inc. Investor presentation. Throughout this recorded meeting, investors are being listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company can view all questions submitted today and publish responses where, where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Alex Nikoporczyk, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining the H1 2024 presentation for TinyBuild. Uh, if you hear barking in the uh, background on my microphone, I do apologize. My dog just recovered from back surgery, so he's able to walk again finally. And he's just really excited about scaring off the neighbors and just uh, really excited in general. That said, uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn over to the disclaimer that I'm sure everyone has read. And uh, presenting today, it will be myself. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TinyBuild and was uh, joined by Jason Jazz Salati, uh, who will uh, run us through the financial part of this presentation. So today we'll do an operational review, then the financial review, and I will give a brief strategic update. And I'm also excited about answering questions today uh, because this has really been a transformative year for TinyBuild. Uh, so we will uh, go through the presentation and then dive straight into the Q&A. So the operational review, uh, as many of you know, in the beginning of this year in January, we have done a capital raise supported by myself and Atsari. Um, this is in light of uh, continued revenue compression in H1 2024, uh, led mostly by uh, platform deals. Uh, so think licensing out content to subscription platforms and also by uh, the mm -hmm. launches of non-core titles. Uh, and uh, what I mean by non-core is uh, the ones that do not fit into our 1000 hour game strategy. By 1,000 hour games, uh, I mean literally that. If you look at the reviews of our titles like uh, Streets of Rogue or Speedrunners or Secret Neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, you go to their Steam pages, you scroll all the way down, and then you uh, check the time played on some of those reviews, it will be thousands of hours. This means that we're really excited about investing into titles that... Um, are highly replayable, that are systems driven, where we create content that can be consumed multiple, multiple times uh, instead of focusing on things like cutscenes that the player sees once, cost us a lot of money, and then never sees again. And this is really heavily underpinned by our portfolio, where the best performing tiles over the years are the ones where players indeed can spend thousands of hours. Now, if we uh, go to the overview slide, I think um, the most interesting parts here, which we will discuss more in detail, is the share of revenue coming from our own intellectual property, which does come with higher margins, with a higher degree of control. So it means that those contracts don't expire, like a typical publishing agreement where the publisher does not own the intellectual property. And also what's really important to note here is 89% of sales coming from our back catalog. This is what I mean by 1,000 hour games. Uh, within our back catalog, we have a few tiles that are evergreen that um, when launched had a good launch year and then going forward in year two, three, four, five, six, seven, even generate very meaningful revenues. This really underpins our business as a whole and creates a solid base <laughs> for us to continue growing. Now, if we look at the IP portfolio, last year we had a higher share of revenues from third-party IP, and that was mostly strategic with sequels to legacy uh, titles that we had. And we're now back to 78% of revenues coming from our own intellectual property. And this will be um, more important, um, more evidently important later on. And if you look at the uh, chart on the left side of the slide, we continue to diversify our revenues. So we're not dependent on a single tile or anything like that. This is a testament to the uh, work that we do on our portfolio and uh, we continue to invest into it, creating a uh, safety cushion for the business. If we look at the back catalog, uh, I just want to highlight a few games here that you should check out. Uh, they're on the slide here. It's Streets of Rogue, it's Secret Neighbor, it's Despot's game, it's Dead Side, etc. So uh, in general, our back catalog is very healthy and continues to generate meaningful revenues for um, the business. 
And with that, I will hand it over to the financial review before taking it over on the strategy side. Jazz? Hello. <clears throat> First half of 2024, so net game revenues, excluding events, fall 20% as we still uh, suffer from uh, lower platform deals, uh, which peaked in 2022. <clears throat> in terms of adjusted EBITDA, we reported 1.9 million loss in the first half of 2024, um, with a, a positive underlying trend uh, months on months from the beginning of the year that leaves us confident in achieving consensus around break even for uh, adjusted EBITDA for the full year. And to close, in terms of net cash from operations on the right hand side, <clears throat> A drop to two million in the first half of the year, as we um, supported some as as we went through some uh, one-off charges, uh, which are not necessarily disclosed separately, including restructuring charges uh, and uh, uh, still uh, uh, exceptional cost for the war in Ukraine. Diving a little deeper in the profit and loss, uh, breaking down revenues. Uh, uh, revenues from uh, uh, direct uh, sales of games uh, were down only 4%, showing how resilient the business is uh, in underlying terms. Development services, which include platform uh, deals, was actually down 31%, and that's really what's moving the needle in the first half of the year. You can see on cost of sales and the GNA, the stronger uh, impact of our cost saving plan uh, put in action at the end of last year and beginning of this year, a drop of 16 and 28% respectively. These are now um, cut back in line with our expectations uh, and we are, we are ready for a, a more balanced second half. I also want to call out a 3 million impairment of development costs, uh, um, which relates to broken roads, um, one of the last games released by uh, versus evil which delivered uh, below expectations in this chart we look a little bit more in depth at platform deals uh, a very large peak in uh, 2022 uh, a very sharp drop in 2023 and a further drop in h1 2024 Year on year, uh, there is still a decline, uh, which means that the second half of the year we is going to have slightly easier comps, at least in terms of platform deals. Moving to cash flow, <clears throat> net cash flow from operations, as I said, uh, 1.92 million uh, positive. That has some uh, changes in its working capital, which are mostly related to seasonality and uh, and timing. Um, we have typically a strong Q4 in terms of PNL uh, with uh, um, with cash received uh, in the uh, part of the year. Uh, but what I really want to call out in this slide is the soft development charge, which moved from 16 million, 17 million to 8.7 million in the in the first half of 2024. Uh, witnessing our strong commitment to cost cutting and to align investments with the revenues. <clears throat> this chart uh, shows more clearly uh, the effort we, we took uh, in terms of uh, development uh, um, software, software development costs uh, peaked in the second half of 2022 and came down sharply from 21.5 to only 8.7 in the first half of the year. On the right hand side, we combine software development and M&A, and you can see um, small disposals happen in the first part of the year in 2024, um, two small IPs that are not uh, consistent with our strategy of a thousand hour game and allowed us to strengthen our financial position. In terms of balance sheet, what I really want to call out um, is the um, Cash at the end of the year, 9.2 million at the end of the uh, at the end of June, uh, 9.2 million uh, dollar cash at the end of June, and in this uh, uh, slide you see positive cash generation, the uh, positive impact of the uh, share issuance in January, the um, uh, networking capital and uh, software development uh, uh, cost M and A positive, as I said disposals to add up to 9.2 million uh, at the end of this at the end of the year half. We're going to continue to use cash in the second half of the year as we near the release of some uh, uh, high potential games and larger budget games we are we have been investing. Over back over to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Jazz. <clears throat> now, if we look at the games launch so far in 2024, we've actually had quite a busy first half and uh, more recently a very busy summer. 
Um, I will want to point out that the first four are legacy tiles and are not necessarily part of our core strategy. Uh, that said, we did have a pleasant surprise with Little Guardsman, uh, which is a very, very wonderful game that had a lot of positive reception and will have a strong long tail going into uh, the end of this year and into next year. Now, the games that I do want to mention fall into our 1,000-hour game strategy. Uh, many acute investors have noticed the launch of Level Zero Extraction earlier in August, uh, which is a tactical extraction horror game where uh, we have aliens and mercenaries fighting it out. Now, the game had a really great launch and then has uh, seen some of its player numbers uh, go down. And we are working on fixing that um, because we have very clear feedback from players and we understand exactly what to do. This game is in early access and this is to be expected. Some of our most popular games um, have had similar launch um, situations where at launch we get a lot of players and then we do a lot of uh, modifications, rebalancing, adding features, and then they go back up. That said, um, I will want to focus this slide on uh, the two bottom ones, Duckside and Drill Core. So Drill Core launched a few weeks ago. It is from our own internal studio that previously launched the game called Black Skylands to a lot of fan reception. And Drill Core is a game, uh, the next game by that studio that focuses on very systems-driven gameplay, infinite replayability, etc. And we're seeing that in the player numbers. If you look at the uh, CCU or concurrent users chart of the game, you will see that within the first week of its launch, it gained more peak players than the day before. And this is exactly what we want to see with these thousand hour games, because the more time players spend in the game, the more users the game will actually attract, because we know the users are enjoying the game, they will recommend it to other players, and that makes our marketing efforts so much easier. Um, please take a look at the SteamDB stats for Drill Core to understand what I mean. And more recently, we have had a very first in the company's history with the launch of Duckside last Wednesday. <clears throat> so for acute investors, um, you will know that we bought a company called Bad Pixel, responsible for a game called Deadside, which is a survival PvP shooter. And what we did is for our studio in uh, Riga, Latvia, Tiny Build Riga, uh, we took the technology of Deadside and uh, allowed the studio in Riga to um, reiterate on it because the technology is very unique. It allows um, over 50 players to be on the same map, build a lot of constructions, build uh, their own bases, and be able to compete with each other for resources. Mm -hmm. This is extremely difficult to do. And within 10 months of starting development on Duckside, we were able to launch it last Wednesday. And uh, between Wednesday and yesterday, Sunday, we were uh, getting more and more concurrent players at their peak. Uh, this is a testament to um, technology being shared between our studios and really an example of when a studio that uh, we have internally ships a game, which is very important to be able to ship a game. They have shipped Hello Engineer, which was a Hello Neighbor spin-off game for the Google Stadia. And uh, in record time, we were able to ship another game with that studio that is now getting a lot of fanfare. I'm happy to answer questions about that one. Uh, but this shows how using a lot of data-driven decisions, uh, data-driven marketing, uh, we're able to, in record time, uh, set the precedent for a game launching that is essentially a, multi, a massive multiplayer game with Ducks that was um, announced on April 1st to take the market by storm. So I'm really excited about that one, and please send us questions about that one. That said, going towards the pipeline, uh, we have a very exciting pipeline that is announced. We have more games, obviously, in the works. I just want to highlight um, a couple of games here. Uh, the one that does have a launch date is Streets of Rogue 2, which is set to the end of October, which is the highly anticipated sequel to the original. <coughs> please uh, consider going... Uh, Jess, do you mind muting yourself, please? 
um, please consider going to the Streets of Rogue Steam page uh, and uh, scroll all the way down to the reviews there and see the amount of hours that players have spent in the original. So we have been working on the sequel for a few years, and that's coming at the end of October. Another obvious one that I'm sure uh, many people have submitted questions about is Kingmakers. Kingmakers is a unique example of when you have uh, technology in the works for years under the hood that gave players something that they were not expecting, yet they know they want it. So the premise of Kingmakers is that um, you have a time-traveling van of all things, um, kind of like Back to the Future, and you travel back in time to medieval battles in um, England with modern weapons, and you're able to mow down thousands upon thousands of enemies on screen. Uh, it sounds like something a five-year-old me would come up with, um, and yes, it is true, yet no one was able to make a game like that, and the announcement, uh, the reception has been absolutely phenomenal. There is a lot of expectations for this game, and we are going to be sharing the release plans for that um, relatively soon. Uh, another tile that is in the portfolio that is making a lot of traction is Sand, created by the studio behind one of our most... Um, uh, most played games, I would say, uh, Secret Neighbor, which is a Hello Neighbor spinoff, Sand takes you to a planet of Sophie, where players compete for resources in giant walking mechs that are also their bases. So for context, um, in games like Duckside and Deadside, players build bases to store their loot, and those uh, remain in a single location on the map. Here you have a walking base, so you have a lot of risk and also a lot of reward because you can steal other players' loot while competing on this uh, phenomenal world that the team has designed. <clears throat> now, just a reminder on our five-year plan. We're still on track this year. Uh, we are launching more big tiles, and uh, we have actually recently gotten into live-action media with a brief announcement from Story Kitchen on an upcoming Kingmakers film. Uh, that said, we are really excited by live-action media and also animation, because animation has been at the core of our business for the past few years with the Hello Neighbor franchise, and they'll talk about that in depth. But the idea is that uh, while platform deals right now on the gaming side are um, a little bit deflated, uh, what we're seeing is that Hollywood is actually very hungry for great intellectual property. And if you watch the Fallout TV series, you don't need to be a fan of the games to really enjoy that series. And this shows how in video games, you can create an IP from essentially scratch and then overnight become a worldwide phenomenon. And this is where I believe the businesses will converge in the next couple of years, where we will have cross-media originating from video games and then transitioning to theaters, to streaming services, uh, etc. So this is a really exciting time, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit more in depth about the Hello Neighbor anime series titled Welcome to Raven Brooks. We have launched season one uh, just over a year ago, and so far it has generated over 275 million minutes watched. Now, uh, for some, million minutes watched is a weird term. Uh, this is what the Nielsen rating uses. To contextualize this, um, the most expensive show in the world, Rings of Power, based on Lord of the Rings by Amazon, has generated about a billion minutes watched in its first week. Now, I understand that this is not apples to apples, but this is just context. We are releasing season two this Halloween, and season three is currently in production. And what we have seen is um, a direct correlation between an uplift in sales and traction for the animated series. And with a really um, lore-rich uh, franchises such as Hello Neighbor, uh, we're seeing that uh, putting that lore into a linear media format that is easily consumable actually expands the audience. And fans are calling this the best pro product within the franchise. And that's outside of millions of books sold, millions of um, uh, game um downloads across all platforms etc so we are really excited about the future of uh doing this cross-media strategy and fueling our core business which is video games to close off um 
just to remind everyone about our core strategy, we are a global developer publisher. We invest into intellectual property with the ultimate goal to bring that IP to multiple media formats, to expand it, and to unlock its full potential over the years. And uh, you may not know this, but typically a video game intellectual property unlocks its full potential over the course of a decade or even more. We have seen this with major publishers like Capcom with a Resident Evil series and countless others. So we're really excited to continue following the strategy because we strongly believe in it. And the board does remain confident that uh, we have adopted the right strategy and we are on track to deliver within expectations. And with that, let's uh, dive into Q&A. Fantastic. I see we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Alex, thank you very much indeed. Alex, yes, thank you indeed for the presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions just using the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, as you just said, Alex, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you very much for investors for those. Um, Jazz, if I may just hand back to you and just to click on that Q&A tab and we're appropriate to do so, read out the question and I'll pick up from you at the end. Certainly. Um, I've tried to regroup the, uh, the questions already received uh, um, in, uh, in different sections. So starting with games, the first, section, the first question is on uh, Halo Neighbor 2. What changes have you made or can be made uh, uh, to improve Halo Neighbor 2? Would you consider improving the existing game to align it to the 1,000 hour strategy? For example, adding multiplayer, uh, make a map more open world, or what else? Uh, with Hello Neighbor 2, it has been quite an uh, interesting challenge in terms of development because uh, we have always anticipated the game to be more open world. Uh, that said, um, in the public domain, uh, there have been some developments within the Hello Neighbor franchise that I cannot disclose the uh, insights of. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. if you search for RBO uh, on Steam, you will get an idea of what we're cooking, and it does involve multiplayer, and I can neither confirm or deny if it's part of the whole neighbor franchise. Second question on uh, uh, level zero extraction. Actually, a few questions on uh, mm -hmm. LZE. Can you discuss the performance of LZE to date? Uh, why has the momentum uh, um, faded uh, um, into launch uh, compared to the beta and the demos? Yeah, so the launch has actually been uh, quite uh, the momentum. Uh, there was a lot of traction behind it. And the challenge with these kind of games is uh, we really wanted to make an asymmetrical game. Uh, so you have two classes of uh, players within any match. You have the aliens and the mercenaries. <clears throat> the aliens are fighting the mercenaries, um, and the mercenaries are also fighting each other. And uh, the challenge with that kind of game design is balance of how do you make it infinitely playable? Uh, because um, if you look at the reviews, whenever we do a patch and we do a, what's, it's called a buff. Um, so essentially making one side stronger than the other, then the side that is not made stronger is really upset. And we have a clear plan over the next few months of how to use data-driven decisions to turn that around. It is definitely a challenge and it's also ex an exciting one. <clears throat> what is the strategy to get players back uh, again on LZ? Uh, the strategy is updates that revolve around major changes uh, to spice up the gameplay. And uh, what about the impact of uh, cheaters uh, in the game? Oh, right. So um, if you've done your homework, and I see the person that asked the question has done it, uh, what we did on launch day is we had a press event um, where... Uh, because of some technicalities, the anti-cheat system was not implemented for the first about six hours of the launch day, and that is when we got a lot of comments about cheers. Uh, that issue has been fixed. Uh, <coughs> it, let me just caveat that. You can never fully fix a cheater problem in an online player versus player game, uh, but right now it is much smaller than it was on launch. Moving on to Ramen, how has Ramen actually done in terms of revenues and do you regret going for free-to-play? Uh, I still believe that the strategy of going free-to-play on the Epic Game Store was the right one. Uh, the question is uh, if we can uh, turn the stats around and make sure that users continuously, well, continue playing. 
Uh, that is an ongoing uh, project that uh, we are still committed to. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about uh, Epic's marketing capability, which has not been fully realized yet for when we turn the, the stats around for that title. Moving on to dark side, um, is there uh, any uh, any cannibalization with that side in terms of players? And uh, how did you determine the price for dark side? Right. So um, dark side, as I mentioned, <laughs> shares the game engine of that side, and uh, we're actually not seeing uh, cannibalization at all because uh, even though they're in the same genre. Um, the dead side target audience is much more hardcore and uh, they come from military style shooters. Um, and while duck side um, actually uh, fixes a few issues that casual players have with hardcore survival shooters. Uh, and there are two main issues with that. One is the amount of running because in an open world, if you get uh, taken out by other players um, and you don't have respawn points around, there is a lot of running and idle time. And some players do enjoy that. And uh, that is a lot of the dead side audience. While in duck side, you fly. That, uh, that was the thing that we wanted to fix. We wanted to make the character controller really fluid and mobile. The second uh, issue that uh, players have in these style of games is uh, it is called roof camping. Uh, when you build a large base, you sit on your roof, you're untouchable, and you just take off players and, well, essentially laugh at them. Uh, Again, in Duck Sight, since you're able to fly, there is no such thing as roof camping. So the crossover is, uh, it is there, but it's also quite minimal in terms of the more hardcore versus the more casual. And players will hate me for calling them casual because the game is still very difficult, um, but it's more accessible, I would say. Uh, the price point for Duck Side, we've had a lot of discussions about because what we believe is that a lot of players don't know that they will love this kind of genre. Uh, a lot of players in Duck Side have been playing um, what's called PvE survival games, so player versus environment, where there is no um, player versus player interaction. So there is no risk of dying to another player. Uh, and we determined that um, a $15 price point would be a really accessible way for players to experience that, which we're seeing with the concurrent player numbers. Uh, and also we launched uh, with a launch discount that puts it just below $10, which gives the game a lot more visibility, which I do believe is paying off right now. One to close on uh, uh, that side <clears throat> is the uh, m is the um, engine, the uh, game engine, uh, possibly usable for other games like Sand or else. Uh, so Sand does use a different uh, game engine uh, because of its mechanics, where you have giant walking bases. Uh, but one would be smart to assume that uh, reusing existing technology uh, might be fruitful. Moving on to Streets of Rogue, uh, does Tani build the only IP? Uh, did we ever disclose that? Well, it is an internal studio, so yes. Um, moving on to Kingmakers, <clears throat> it has become one of the most anticipated titles since reveal. Can you give more color on the upside of the game? Um, Um, so the game is one of those uh, rare lighting and ball situations where everything went right with the reveal and with the upcoming marketing beats. Uh, we are knee deep, well, probably neck deep at this point in the game design to make sure that we deliver something that players um, on one hand expect and on the other hand will be really pleased by. Um, so there is a lot of pressure on us with Kingmakers, and I'm personally committed to making sure that the game launches in its best shape and form. Is this an internal studio for Kingmakers or external, and do, do we own the IP? I will revert the second question to you because I'm not sure if we have ever revealed that. Um, that said, it is an external studio that we have a great relationship with that uh, had previously launched a hit game called Road Redemption. Yeah, we haven't disclosed the IP ownership. Uh, yeah. Moving on to uh, more questions on games, uh, um, more general questions. How do you ensure you attract a casual, less committed players to a thousand hour games? Uh, that is a phenomenal question. Um, I think um, what makes a more, well, 
casual game great is when it becomes a habit. Uh, and what I mean by that is when every night you sit down in front of your PC or maybe your portable device, and that is your go-to game to relax. Um, and I think the best example we have so far is the, one of the most recent ones is Drill Core. We see players coming back every night and spending two, three, four, five hours of just like one more match. Um, and while the game visually appears uh, maybe a little bit more hardcore, um, through the Steam recommendations engine, we were able to attract an audience that just continues playing it and never actually knew that they would enjoy it so much so for anyone who hasn't try, tried drill core uh, if you're a remotely gamer if you like games like the classic minesweeper or one of my all-time favorites kingdom rush or any tower defense game please try it you will love it okay next question beyond your announced your announced the pipeline of games are there any other major title under development we are always developing tiles and um, doing a lot of them in stealth mode uh, before revealing them. So we have a lot of games in development. Shifting your strategy from building games, uh, game franchises to building a thousand hour games seems risky because the success is less predictable. Why have you chosen this focus for new games? It's uh, not a shift in strategy. It's the same strategy. We are building franchises out of games that players spend a lot of time in. Therefore, if a player enjoys the game and continues playing it, it increases our chances of uh, building a franchise. Um, on the other hand, just for context, uh, building a franchise out of a really expensive game that might win all of the Game of the Year awards that players play, let's say, for 10 or 20 hours is much more difficult because the expectations set by that original that players do love, they will finish it, um, between getting another tile that players really uh, enjoy within that franchise is just too much of a risk. So this is the less risky move to focus on systems-driven gameplay that players spend a lot of time in. Moving on to multimedia, uh, can you disclose what is Tiny Build spending on the, the Kingmakers movie? Uh, we cannot disclose that, uh, but uh, what I will say is that um, we are not interested in funding uh, expensive uh, ventures ourselves. Can you discuss the economics of uh, Welcome to Ravenbrook Season 2 and possibly also of Kingmakers? Uh, I cannot discuss Kingmakers. What I can say is that uh, the animated series for Hello Neighbor, Welcome to Raven Brooks, uh, has had a very positive effect on our core game sales. Uh, so that one is a very strategic investment that we have done that we're seeing is um, contributing to the franchise as a whole in a very positive way. How significant is the contribution to adjusted EBITDA generated from uh, multimedia? That would be a question to you, Jazz. Um, I don't think we've ever disclosed it. Yes. So the the multimedia bit is uh, is complicated for what Alex just said in terms of a uh, uh, cross uh, cross pollination to to games. So every time we start a multimedia project, uh, we make sure that the multimedia project pays for itself, um, which means limiting the budget on one side and making sure that we have that positive uh, impact on game sales. Um, we are expanding our channels uh, for uh, uh, Welcome to Ravenbrooks. We added, for example, uh, Amazon, giving us more visibility. And we, we're looking forward to the launch of Season 2 of Welcome to Ravenbrooks. Um, the trailers for Season 2 uh, have been very well received. Uh, we now have a, a good installed base of, uh, of followers. Uh, we're looking forward to that, to, um, to see a more, uh, more direct contribution to Adjust Ribida. Yeah, just uh, for context on that, uh, if you go to our YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash tinybuildgames and go to the community tab, you will see the amount of engagement that we get whenever we post any screenshot or GIF uh, or a trailer for um, the season two of the anime series. Moving on to um, uh, more financial questions, starting with a couple of uh, questions on uh, compensation. Um, why there is not an executive share-based compensation scheme? And maybe I can take that one. Um, we're always working on uh, on improving uh, um, compensation schemes uh, for executive and and not. 
Um, there have been uh, complications, um, very, very plainly, uh, in particular due to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, we have, we think, we, we, we're close to finding a solution and there might be an, announce, an announcement soon. What we have been um, trying to do internally is to make sure that uh, uh, everybody uh, has a regular conversation to, uh, um, with, with, with their reporting uh, uh, manager and making sure that compensation is uh, adequate and, uh, and revised uh, frequently. <clears throat> Another question on compensation is, uh, uh, why not change executive uh, performance-based uh, uh, payout to be linked to per share data? Uh, we have considered that, and uh, that's still uh, under consideration. There are, um, there are uh, um, drawbacks in uh, moving to per share data, uh, like there are uh, drawbacks in focusing only on revenues or only on profitability or only on cash. Uh, the, uh, the best uh, uh, performance plan, the best targets are the ones that are fully embraced by, uh, by everybody, management uh, and the whole company. And for that, again, with the messaging internally and the, the, the teamwork internally needs to be... Uh, and needs to be the focus uh, more than the actual measure per se. Moving on to financials, <clears throat> what is the outlook for depreciation and amortization in the coming years, uh, given the level of capitalized software development in recent years? Is 2024 a peak, uh, peak year for DNA, or uh, that could increase in 2025? So we have um, we have spoken very uh, openly about the launch of uh, new high potential games. High potential games also means um, higher budgets, slightly higher budget or higher budget altogether. So the, there will be an increase in uh, uh, in uh, amortization of uh, dev costs uh, in 2025 uh, as new games, new higher potential games launch. When can we expect a return to positive free cash flow generation? Another question. <clears throat> Consensus for this year is looking at uh, uh, around break even at the uh, adjusted EBITDA level. It's going to take a, a little longer to get to positive uh, free cash flow generation. Uh, we will have to uh, go through the launch of these games, uh, bear in mind that towards the last phase of development of a game, uh, you incur a higher cost, uh, that being a localization or QA or the same marketing. So just before launching a bigger game, you're going to have a bigger cash need, which will then be offset by um, the, um, the coming revenues. Next question. <clears throat> How much in software development cost has, on average, been spent on each of the major titles to be released in 2024 and 2025? And how confident are you in achieving good returns on investment? We haven't given out uh, an, an average number. We have uh, broken out uh, software development cost in, uh, in um, past slides, and we might do that in future if there is interest, um, showing that we were uh, investing in over 30 titles. Um, and that is a good, uh, a good, um, uh, good metric to, to bear in mind. Next question. Where should we expect the gross and operating margins to trend in 2025, given the level of own IP games being released? We are um, we are focusing on um, on IP. We're focusing on improving gross margins and, as a result, operating margins. Um, the the primary driver of of margins uh, um, at this point is going to be revenue growth. So we we need to we need to work on the titles on the high potential titles we have uh, very carefully and make sure that the launch is successful. Another question. Following the sale of several IPs recently, can you discuss the opportunities to unlock value from other assets uh, in the company? Uh, for context, we have sold the two IPs in the first half of the year, uh, Surgeon Simulation, Simulation and uh, um, uh, TRDS, Total Reliable Delivery Services. Um, we're always uh, looking at, uh, at our portfolio. Um, there is uh, uh, nothing I can say, of course, about uh, uh, discussions uh, in the future. But if uh, an IP or else doesn't belong, doesn't um, doesn't get the right valuation inside the portfolio, a disposal is possible. At this point, I can't make any for, any further comments. Next question: How much has the increased discounting of game prices pulled forward sales from future years across the back catalog? Um, maybe this one is for you, Alex. Uh, increased counting of game prices and if that pulled forward uh, sales from future years. 
Yeah, that, that's a very interesting one because whenever there is a deep discount on a game, uh, what happens is two things. Um, there are existing players who have wishlisted the game and might finally pull the trigger on actually getting it. And then uh, we usually do featured sales for specific tiles, so they will show up on uh, promotion on the Steam front page or on the console front pages, and more people will actually wishlist them for a later date. So um, the discounting is... Uh, I understand that the sentiment might be that when you do a deep discount, you kind of like uh, pull forward sales. Uh, we're not seeing that. We're seeing that uh, games after a discount, when they uh, perform well and players actually like them, we see their sales at full price actually uh, slightly go higher. And this is normal amongst uh, the other publishers that I talk to when uh, you do a deep discount. Another question on back catalog. How quickly uh, could revenue from existing back catalog sales deteriorate in uh, 2025 and 2026? That's a wild hypothetical. Uh, we are seeing that games that players continuously play, that they spend a lot of time in, uh, that they do not have a very significant rate of uh, deterioration in terms of sales. Um, I will caveat that, that you see that with more linear tiles, so games that you can beat in a few hours, enjoy yourself, and that's about it. Uh, the thing about uh, those style of games is that uh, when you can watch a full walkthrough of a game on YouTube, for example, or watch a stream, uh, many players feel like they've experienced it by proxy, by watching it. Uh, whereas with systems-driven games where you make your own decisions and your gameplay session is actually your own, it feels very unique to you. Uh, it doesn't matter that uh, people have watched the walkthrough or a stream, people will still want to experience those emotions for themselves. I guess that's the core difference between linear games and highly replayable tiles. What proportion of revenues does merchandising make up? Um, I'm not sure if we ever disclosed that, Jazz. Do you want to disclose it? It's, it, it is minor. Um, it is it is very small percentage. Will you consider putting a, 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 our annual multi-year guidance for key financial statements line items? Um, <clears throat> We, we, we would consider that uh, if there was a, a clear advantage. Um, the, uh, the dilemma we are facing uh, internally is uh, setting any target, that being revenues, uh, just a little bit dark cash or else, uh, could actually um, force the strategy into the right direction or the wrong direction for the long term. So for that, uh, what, we, what we are focusing is value creation for the long term. The fact that Alex is majority shareholder is, is the uh, um, um, most uh, the ultimate guarantee that that is the, that is the uh, ultimate focus of the company another question are there any games that have significantly outsold on Nintendo's platform versus other distribution platforms yes that's about uh, as much you, as I can say can you comment on which one are they no that would be commercially sensitive and there are games that sell very well on Switch compared to other platforms. What cash position would you like to return the business to and remain above over the next few years? That's a great question. Um, what we're trying to achieve in terms of cash position is, uh, is a balance of uh, um, revenues and investments. We have, as we sit now, uh, a, a bunch of uh, new investment opportunities, very interesting, that we have not pulled the trigger on yet because uh, we want to maintain a very strong financial position. Um, the, the exact, the, there is no exact number. It will depend on the uh, time to, uh, uh, to ship the game for every single project, on the current trend of revenues, on the current trend of the industry. Um, right now, we feel like we have re-established uh, um, a strong financial position. As I mentioned, we will still use cash in the second half of the year, so we go a little lower. Um, the consensus is at low single digit for the full year um, cash for cash at the end of December 2024. Uh, but we, we want to maintain um, a, a few millions buffer um, a, a, and more um, over the long term. 
Next question, in terms of the amount of development uh, um, CapEx invested, what does your game pipeline look like for 2025 in comparison to the game released planned for 2024? I can take this one. Um, yeah, please. We, yeah. In terms of uh, um, development capex, uh, we continue to invest to create a, a, a smooth flow of uh, of games. Um, so we we are also investing now in games which have not been announced and in games that will uh, will release uh, uh, far in the future. Uh, um, possibly even after 2025. Um, we haven't disclosed exactly how much. Um, there is a balance. And as I said, uh, uh, games that are near launch consume more cash uh, because there are more, more things to do, including porting, localization, QA, and, uh, and marketing. How many projects do you currently have in development? Uh, and uh, what's the average budget per project? Uh, um, similar question. Um, we have launched uh, uh, so far in the year 10 games. Um, so you, you will look at us uh, looking for um, a, a similar number of projects to, to, to add to the portfolio to, to maintain a, a nice flow of games in the future. There will be different budgets, uh, uh, low or high. When we say, for clarity, when we say higher potential games or higher budget games, we mention, we, we refer to games with a budget over 1 million. We will continue to have uh, uh, lower budget games because they represent a very interesting option um, and they typically have a, a <clears throat> an interesting uh, an interesting uh, um, vibe that that resonates with uh, with a lot of our uh, audience another question do you see budget for uh, uh, future new IP titles coming down in relation to your recent and upcoming releases um, not necessarily. Um, I don't think, um, Alex, we, we can see a, a, a direction up or down in terms of the average budget. Uh, we will again choose game by game, situation by situation. Yeah, I would say that um, the industry had a very sobering slap on its face uh, in terms of overinvestment uh, during the past few years, especially during the pandemic. Um, but that said, there is no like rule of thumb on the budgets. I'm moving to questions uh, which have just come out uh, during uh, during the call. So apologies if we will be jumping uh, left and right. Could you please explain uh, how the 946 uh, bad debt occurred uh, in uh, in H1? The um, the technicalities of uh, uh, of that is uh, um, revenues which which we were expecting, which we which we realized will uh, will not we will not be able to collect anymore. Um, which item in the cash flow statement contains the two million payment for the legal settlement uh, uh, with Steve Escalante? Um, I'll take that offline. <clears throat> Your chairman said in the last annual report, in the next 12 to 36 months, there will be more space for tiny build games. Uh, was it in reference to the start of 2024 or publication date of the report? Are you in a good position to profit for the next two or three years when you have the investments in new games compared to H1 2023? Um, okay, I will take a part of that question. Um, I think the major thing that has changed for us in terms of company structure is uh, that we are not going in the blind uh, in terms of uh, spending uh, a lot of time in developing game and then revealing it. Uh, if you go to tinybuild.com, there is a blog section where I talk about our um, Tiny Build Direct, how we announced a whole bunch of games during it in May, and how we, um, I won't say dominated, but we are really, really visible during the Steam's uh, Summer Next Festival. Uh, and it will give you an idea of how we approach um, investments and uh, how we test things as early as possible. And for those things that work, we will continue to invest and maybe invest more. And for things that don't work, we change uh, direction. Another question from Jack. Um, could you please elaborate on the one-off charges in the cash flow, um, in the cash flow operations, not separately listed in the earnings release? Um, in the uh, at the end of last year, at the beginning of this year, we had some uh, some one-off charges relating, for example, to a, a reorganization, the cost action plan. Uh, we have decided that the the materiality of them and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the, uh, the the situation um, did not did not grant that uh, status of exceptional charges. So we we have listed them uh, as uh, simply um, recurring charges. 
Another question coming from uh, Shaheen. Uh, considering the success you had with the uh, uh, drilled core and oxide while uh, less than six months passed between announcement and release, are you planning to take a similar approach with new games? Alex? Um, we are taking a similar approach with some of the new tiles. Uh, keep in mind that these two games are exceptional because uh, their development uh, cycle was also very short. Uh, duck side, because of uh, reusing um, existing technology from that side, uh, has taken about 10 months from inception to launch and uh, a slightly longer timeline, still very short, with drill core. Uh, so here, these were just uh, unique situations that we have been building towards uh, facilitating with our internal studios. When we see a great idea, we see a great prototype, and we can immediately jump on rapid development of it, uh, knowing all of the variables, and then double verifying or double checking that they click with the audience during early playtests. Uh, the, what I will tell you is that we do love playtesting as early as possible and we do it a lot publicly and we also do it a lot privately. That is where a lot of our decision making comes from. Question from Shaheen. As someone who doesn't play survival games, can you explain what makes that side different from games like Rust? Right, so games like Rust are very chaotic uh, and I love them uh, because you meet a lot of other players and uh, you have a lot of interaction with them. Not all so positive. Um, that is what makes it fun. Uh, in games like Dead Side, it is for a slightly uh, older audience that like uh, their simulation, their military style genre. And this is what we've been working on a lot with the community is to figure out what upcoming features we focus on. And um, if you read through the uh, Steam posts on that side or join the Discord, you will get what I mean. We had a lot of discourse and a lot of communication with that community, uh, which is very particular. And uh, if you don't play survival games uh, that are player versus player, uh, if you download any game like Dead Side or Rust or Ark Survival Evolved, etc., I highly recommend you join um, what is called PVE servers where other players cannot kill you. Um, that is a great way to learn the game. Uh, because otherwise, um, if you're trying to understand the genre and you go to a traditional player versus player server, you may not have a good time but players really love it, especially those that grew up playing uh, games like this. What are the plans for Pigeon Simulator? Uh, we right now um, do not disclose the plans for that specific IP. Would you still, oops, uh, would you still sign new games where you don't control the IP? For strategic reasons, uh, that is quite possible, and we are doing that. And uh, strategic reasons means that we may want to get into a new genre, or we may want to continue working with a developer, or um, something along those lines where we know that uh, the long-term um, risk of not owning the IP is justified for a really good game launch. Can you please advise your commitment to remaining a listed entity, or do you think uh, um, we're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Um, I have invested $10 million of my own funds to remain listed uh, earlier this year, so I'm pretty committed. What is the strategy to get the stock price on track? to launch really good games, uh, to communicate with investors really transparently, and uh, to regain the trust in the markets as the industry rebounds. What is the strategy, what is the reasoning behind the releasing uh, Welcome to Ravenbrook's uh, Season 2 uh, late, so late, uh, around Halloween, and why not release it as soon as possible? Uh, releasing it as soon as possible would be an option. Uh, however, the thematic of releasing it around Halloween or starting to release episodes around Halloween uh, makes more sense in the spirit of uh, the season. And also, uh, the later we go into the year, in most places, uh, the weather gets worse. Uh, so uh, fans are much more likely to tune into our show.
what is your medium term uh, i one or two year target for sales revenue levels and EBITDA margins uh, or other applicable metrics <clears throat> So we look at, uh, at 2024 as a, as the year of reset, uh, where we have, um, if you want to see in, uh, um, the, the trough in uh, platform deals, we have, uh, as I said, uh, seen uh, the underlying revenues from actual game sales uh, pretty much flat in the first half. So this, this is for us a starting point. Uh, we are working, we, we have the best pipeline we've ever had. If you look at uh, uh, the number of followers uh, or uh, Alex post on the 3 million wish list that we, we, um, we added in, uh, in June, it gives you a very strong idea of how strong, uh, how, um, how big is the potential of the current pipeline. So with that should come revenue increase and with that should come margin expansion. Um, EBITDA break even for uh, for this year and uh, an improvement for next year is what we're targeting. What is behind your focus on the PC first uh, when you launch games? Oh right, so a lot of our games that we launched uh, this year, especially the strategic ones, are in early access, which means that we can rapidly develop it uh, and uh, get patches out. Uh, the reason to launch on PC first is because uh, there is a little bit less overhead in terms of, uh, it's called certification for consoles when you need to, well, first, you need to optimize the technology behind the game to make sure that it runs on consoles. And second, you need to have that uh, technology meet certain certification requirements for the consoles. Uh, so doing uh, PC first is more rapid iteration. And uh, going forward, um, the idea is that we want our games to be available on every platform possible uh, and we're just being very strategic with allocating resources to where it makes sense okay and um, final question um on a, on a lighter tone uh, what game have you what game uh, um, from tiny build have you most uh, enjoyed player in the last few months um, so full disclosure, I'm sitting in a brace right here, like my leg is covered in, uh, you know, had some knee surgery that was long overdue, not an emergency, but what I've been playing the crap out of part of my French is drill core. Uh, if you have a steam deck or if any of your kids have a steam deck, try it, uh, have someone explain, well, the tutorial is actually pretty good. So you will get the hang of it. I've been playing drill core like crazy. And when I can sit in front of my PC, I've been playing duck side. Uh, both of those styles, I, I don't remember the last time I've spent hundreds of hours in our own games, uh, probably outside of dead side. So please check those out. If you're gamers and you're listening to us, once you get it, uh, once you understand what I mean by the 1000 hour game and you're like, you know, tomorrow night or on the weekend, you're going like, oh, I'm going to play one more round of drill core. And then you've had seven rounds and it's 1 a.m. You will know exactly what I mean. This is a really exciting time for the company because we finally figured out what the recipe is, what is uh, the the idea of creating long term sustainable franchises with thousands of hours spent by players in them. Uh, it is real, it is here, and I'm really excited about it and also fully committed. That was the last question. Paul? Okay, well, we can also say some anecdotes while we wait in silence here. Uh, but that said, um, I think the the core of um this year has been a real reset for us i'm just going to do a closing statement while we uh, wait up for paul um it's it's been extremely difficult with the whole industry um being in uh, turmoil uh, and i do believe that we've actually gone past it i do believe that uh the bottom of the games industry has been around april may uh, when uh, we've seen a lot of game delays, we've seen a lot of uh, overinvestment into the industry not pay off. Uh, fortunately for us, going through the extremely difficult period of the beginning of the year, uh, we were able to get ahead of it and refocus on things that work and use uh, very data-driven decisions for investments, where we allocate those investments. So... I'm really excited about the industry and uh, I am committed to shipping some really, really good games. 
Fantastic. Jazz, Alex, thanks indeed for updating investors today. Ladies and gentlemen, please do um, continue to stay on uh, just while we redirect you to provide your feedback and all the management team can better understand your views and expectations. It's going to take a few moments to complete. I know it's greatly appreciated by the company. On behalf of Tiny Build and Jazz and Alex, many thanks indeed for attending today's presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.